Cancer is a condition where both the disease and the treatment can have major nutrition implications. For example, cancer itself could lead to cancer cachexia, which would be a malnutrition status. Going through chemotherapy could give the patient a lot of GI symptoms as side effects, and this could affect their dietary intake. Therefore, overwhelmingly, when we deal with cancer patients as dietitians, malnutrition is the theme we need to keep in mind. The goals of nutrition care for cancer patients include prevention and reversal of nutritional def de deficiencies, preserving lean body mass, and this is consistent with fighting and correcting malnutrition. For patients undergoing treatment, we want to minimize nutrition-related side effects and also maximize quality of life no matter what stage the patient is at. Malnutrition and weight loss in cancer patients are associated with increased mortality. This is not news to us because other conditions, uh, the loss of, of a significant significant amount of body weight and lean mass is also associated with death. So the primary goal, as we mentioned, is to prevent malnutrition. We need to understand that the nature of the disease promotes the body to go through the wasting process. Therefore, reversing malnutrition can be very challenging. Since cancer is a chronic illness, Depending on how long the patient has had the diagnosis and if they have received multiple treatments, malnutrition can be very severe and more prevalent. Basically, the longer the cancer history, including the longer the treatment history, then the more likely we would be seeing the patients with malnutrition. Depending on the type of cancer, so which organ or tissue the disease affects, the patient may have different risks for malnutrition. For example, a few cancers listed here, so lung, pancreatic, GI, head and neck, ovarian cancers, these patients are at very high risks for malnutrition. And this is because, you know, for example, if it's pancreatic cancer, then these patients won't have normal digestive enzymes from the pancreas, not to mention the wasting nature of cancer itself. Therefore, the digestion and absorption process will be severely compromised. Then the result is malnutrition and cancer, so this is a vicious cycle that can push people towards a negative outcome. When we conduct nutrition assessments for cancer patients, an additional, um, you know, we, we check the usual things that, you know, should be pretty routine by now. And specifically, we have different tools to assess the general condition of the patient. For example, we have the Patient Generated Subjective Global Assessment, or the PGSGA, and also uh, MUST, the Malnutrition Universal Screening Tool. These are already validated tools, and if you recall what you learned in nutrition assessment, these tools are very easy to apply. It's not a tedious process that exhausts both the professionals and the patients, so these are tools that are validated and easy to use. In terms of nutrition diagnosis, it will widely vary depend on, depending on the type of cancer and how severe the disease and also the treatment modality. For example, someone who is actively receiving uh, chemotherapy treatment, uh, for these patients, almost everyone in these cases has altered GI function and are usually having nausea and vomiting. Or if they are doing radiation treatment, they may have dysphagia or a lot of pain when they swallow because the radiation hurts the mucosa of the GI tract. Or if it's a breast cancer patient, then because the breast tissue is relatively 
uh, comparatively far, further away from other internal organs, the radiation itself may not have a lot of GI effects. However, it may have certain respiratory effects because of the breast tissue being above the lung tissue. So all of this could change the diagnosis depending again on the severity of the cancer, the type of cancer, and treatment mo modality. So it must be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. So here are some side effects associated with cancer and its treatment. And we did see a similar list when we talked about chemotherapy. Although other therapies could lead to these side effects depending on the case. For example, for radiation therapy, if it's the GI tract, then uh, maybe like esophageal cancer, then we would see a lot of these GI-related side effects. Because of this, it would be very uncomfortable for the patient to eat anything. Therefore, one strategy is to increase the density of whatever they're eating to make every bite count. So, for, in for instance, we could make a very nutrient-dense smoothie, as shown in the figure here, to maximize nutrient delivery if the patient can tolerate oral intake. And different companies also make some high energy, high protein beverages for people who have these conditions that are able to drink, obviously. So for example, um, Abbott makes Ensure or there's Boost by Nestle. So this here is a good summary to have and those companies also have free apps or online product information that we can refer to as well. So here we have nutrition therapy for anorexia. So we're putting this in cancer treatment, but there are other types, but for other types of anorexia, these strategies can also be very useful. So remember, in this case for anorexia, meaning loss of appetite. So this is not the same as the eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, where someone is refusing to eat to lose weight. So again, we're referring to strategies for dealing with loss of appetite. And if we look at this table, we want to eat smaller, more frequent meals. And that's understandable because when a patient does not have a good appetite, they probably won't be able to eat a large meal, which you know can take a long time to finish. Also, limiting fluid. So this would help um, avoid the feeling of fullness. And the, you might remember we had a similar strategy when talking about post-bariatric patients. They are advised not to drink fluid with solid food and we want to separate those, so eating food and drinking fluid, by at least 30 minutes or so because this way they can maximize the intake of the solid food which has more nutrients. So this is a similar strategy here. Um, if they don't have a good appetite, we want to use that limited appetite to allow them to intake solid food and then of course drink water separately. And also, um, another thing to kind of emphasize is uh, a glass of wine before a meal may help stimulate the appetite. And this is not only for cancer patients. There are studies that indicate, uh, for example, say in nursing home residents, seniors with a glass of wine may also have increased appetite. So this could be something that is useful. And if we think about it, drinking wine could also be a social event. So this may help cancer patients to deal with stress or improve their mood, and that itself could have a positive impact on their appetite. However, we do need to check with the doctor first. There may be contraindications for alcohol depending on the patient's medications and treatments. And also, of course, we are talking about you know, having one glass of wine, so moderate drinking, because we do know that excessive alcohol consumption can increase cancer risk. Another thing is to, um, you know, keeping favorite foods available at all times. 
especially for patients who have had cancer over a long period of time or, her, or who currently are receiving treatment. Their appetite may come and go quickly, so we really want to honor their food preferences because decreased intake is a prevalent problem. So if they have their favorite foods handy, then when they feel like it, they can have a few bites and enjoy the food that they love. This in itself could boost their mood and of course is also bringing in more nutrients, more energy to help combat malnutrition or risk of. So this list of strategies is very useful for any reason when a patient is suffering from loss of appetite. For patients who are receiving chemo and radiation therapy, uh, due to side effects experienced during these therapies, sometimes patients cannot really have an adequate intake. So both of, in, flu, both of food and fluid through P, the PO route. In this case, we need to assess if specializing nutrition support is indicated. So we do have some standards here. So the patient has to be malnourished and, um, and we anticipate that the patient won't be able to ingest or absorb adequate nutrition for a prolonged period of time. So, you know, the malnutrition is pretty common in cancer patients. And then we also need to look at um, if we suspect that they will not be able to have adequate intake. So this means that even if they can intake a certain amount of oral intake, their body cannot get enough, it's not adequate, through the oral route. <coughs> Obviously, knowing that, we need to start thinking about whether EN or PN is appropriate. Sometimes it may be beneficial to provide certain nutrition interventions prior to a patient's surgery. Because we know patient's surgery itself is a controlled trauma and that would increase the patient's need for energy and protein. But if they are already malnourished, their post-op complications will be more likely to happen. What we want to do is something to prepare the, body's, the patient's body to better deal with the incoming trauma caused by the surgery. So after the surgery, unless the gut is not working, we prefer to use enteral nutrition. The benefits should be clear by now. It helps stimulate the intestine, helps reduce potential complications, and it can also prevent the translocation of colon bacteria into other parts of the body. So Aspen has issued some guidelines for intervention for patients who receive bone marrow transplants. Nutrition support per Aspen guidelines is appropriate for patients who are malnourished and ha also have this anticipated inadequate PO intake period. We should be consulting patients on foods that may pose infection risk and let them know about safe food handling. And this is because at this time, until the transplant becomes successful, patients' uh, host immunity is compromised. Therefore, any raw food and things like that could potentially bring infection. In healthy individuals, it may not be an issue, but for these people who are already immunocompromised, it may become a major challenge. And also, if they have the graft-versus-host disease, then this can also be accompanied by poor oral intake and also malabsorption is possible. So Aspen guidelines has clear indications for nutrition support for patients receiving this transplantation therapy. So how do we determine the nutrition requirements? We could use the mifflin saint Jory equation. Remember this has uh, different formulas for men and women. Or we could follow this strategy that is maybe a little bit more practical. So depending on the status of the patients, we have a quick energy allowance reference. 
And um, this is something we can look at quickly to give us some guidance. So depending on um, if they're obese, sedentary, slightly hypermetabolic, um, having malabsorption, those types of things. When it comes to monitoring and evaluation, we definitely need to closely monitor weight status and intake level because the main nutrition theme here is malnutrition and we need to fight it. Then we have to check weight loss, um, see if they are regaining weight, and also if the calorie intake and protein intake, whether it's through PO or through EN or PN support, we need to check if it is meeting the patient's needs, also how well the patients are tolerating the intervention, and any changes in the symptoms. Also, if we did initially use the PGSGA, then that's something we could repeat and see if there's any change in total score or even if there's suggestion for any new problems. 